I think I'm on. Can you guys hear me in the back? Hello. Good. Great. And hopefully Zoom folks can hear me. Um, I'm not in front of the chat at the moment. So uh, thank you for coming to our session. Um, this session is growing an equitable approach to managing the urban Walnut Creek watershed. Um, and that is here. You are in the Walnut Creek watershed. So welcome. Um, so just to let you know if I can figure out how to advance. I guess I advance with this, Rob. Is this correct? Yeah, I would, I'm going to start off with a challenge. The arrow key. I think so. All right, so now try that. Ah, perfect. So I um, want to welcome our partners who will be speaking today. Um, we have Amin Davis with Partners for Environmental Justice. Raise your hand, Amin. Um, he's also with Division of Water Resources, but today he's wearing his PEJ hat. Um, we have Kofi Boone, who's a professor of landscape architecture at NC State's College of Design. Thank you for being here. I'm from WRI and C Grant, and I'll be talking third. Cam McNutt is with Division of Water Resources. Um, and then you can't see them quite yet, but we have Amy Farinelli with City of Raleigh Stormwater Virtual. So you'll see her up here when the time comes. And then we have Carmara Thomas with the Conservation also speaking remotely and Corey Dodd with Design Workshop also speaking remotely. So you'll get a chance to see them in a little later on. Um, and we will be doing this session a little bit differently. We'll be doing brief presentations to tell our stories. Um, and then the last about half hour um, will be discussion uh, with panelists, any questions you have, and we would love to talk with you um, about environmental justice um, during that session. And Kofi will helping, be helping to lead that discussion period. So just so you know what to expect, we'll each have um, PJ's uh, presentation will be about 10 minutes long, but then the rest of our presentations will be about seven minutes long. We haven't built in a lot of time for questions, but if you have a burning question, we could probably take one um, before we move on. Um, and then, like I said, at the end, this is probably gonna be more like 2.30, um, we will have our discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, we're not gonna do lengthy introductions of our speakers. They can introduce themselves as they go, but we're going to kick off with Amin. Uh, thanks, Christy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I first of all, I'd like to thank Christy for coordinating this specific panel discussion and WRI for um, hosting another conference, particularly in the midst of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, I see some, some familiar faces here that may know me from my job with uh, North Carolina Division of Water Resources, um, but this afternoon I'm representing a nonprofit community organization I've been involved with for several years named Partners for Environmental Justice. Um, since, this talk, since this session is uh, titled Lightning Talks, uh, this is going to be a lightning fast presentation. So I'm trying to get, get through it. Um, so let's see, so uh, this historical timeline is provide some context to the, to the presentation I'm gonna be giving. Um, and I'm primarily gonna focus on the um, red boxes in this timeline. Uh, Rochester Heights is one of the first African-American subdivisions uh, constructed in the city of Raleigh around 1957. Uh, Partners for Environmental Justice formed from meetings at St. Ambrose Church, uh, which is next to Rochester Heights, to address perceived environmental injustices going on in that community. Um, in 2004, PEJ, I'm going to say PEJ from now on, PEJ published a uh, historical document which specifically mentioned the Walnut Creek watershed, in addition to um, mentioning that uh, the community was receiving stormwater runoff, lots of stormwater runoff and floodwaters from upstream in the watershed in Cary and Raleigh, which drains uh, ultimately through to that area. Um, lastly, uh, PEJ was involved in the creation of the Walnut Creek water, watershed action team 
which my uh, DWR colleague, Kim McNutt, is going to talk a little bit more about. Uh, so, so this is a, a map of the watershed. Um, and essentially, uh, the, you see blue line. Walnut Creek starts near Cary Town Center uh, on the, in the western part of this map and drains through Lake Johnson, Lake Raleigh, and then eventually through Southeast Raleigh and into the Noose River. Um, the hatch line in the middle represents about half of the watershed, which drains to the Rochester Heights uh, community, which is shown in the red box. And uh, Rochester Heights, for those of you who are familiar with Raleigh, is located immediately south of the Walnut Creek Wetland Park on the other side of Walnut Creek. Uh, so this is just a demographics map. Uh, this is a 2010 census map which shows the percentage, the relative percentage of African-American population broken into census blocks. You can see how drastically the watershed demographics change as you go from upstream in Cary uh, and downstream into Raleigh and Southeast Raleigh. Um, the census block for Rochester Heights back in 2010 was 98.5% African-American. Um, but again, those of you who are familiar with the changes in growth in Raleigh know that uh, those demographics are changing very rapidly, literally by the, <laughs> by the week. Um, I won't steal too much of uh, Professor Boone's presentation. He's gonna get into race elevation and flooding impacts, but I do wanna say that um, there is a 252 foot elevation difference between where it starts and carry 14 miles down to where it empties into the Noose River. And you can see that Rochester Heights in red is in the lowest portion elevation area in the watershed. Um, you can also see here that a significant portion of Rochester Heights is located in the FEMA floodplain, historically and today. Uh, the image on the left is, I know don't try, you don't have to try to read it, but this is a letter from the US Army Corps of Engineers um, it was written to the former city of Raleigh ma uh, manager, city manager. Um, there are two things that this letter points out um, in terms of the results of flood studies that they did. The first is that the, the, the Corps of Engineers was not able to identify uh, any economically feasible flood mitigation measures as part of their flood study. And secondly, they found no significant change in development from the early 70s when they began studying this area to the mid 1980s when this letter was dated. Um, the next four slides, you can come to your own conclusions about whether you think that is true just based on what you see here. This is a 1974 image of the watershed, Walnut Creek watershed draining to Rochester Heights in the red area. This is a 1988 aerial image that shows um, changes in development, 1974, 1988. This is a zoomed in portion. Um, the top area is a Rochester Heights community in red. The bottom is built more hills, another um, uh, historically African-American community. So same dates, 1974, 1988, 1974, 1988. Uh, you can see probably one of the most significant things is Interstate 40 bisected uh, Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills. So uh, again, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that you don't have to be a hydrologist or a, a scientist to realize that um, there were drastic and uh, significant changes in that, both in that community and in the watershed draining to that community. community. So here's where Partners for Environmental Justice comes in. So PJ was formed to address historical environmental justices, one of those being um, flood prone, floodplain land given to an African-American developer to build this community. Secondly, federal government denied the root cause of the flooding, um, or one of the root causes, which was significant upstream development, yet they came to the conclusion that there was no change in development. Um, and then uh, city government chose an, an inequitable course of action for helping to address the flooding um, they were going to charge the residents of Rochester Heights to dredge the unnamed tributary um, that runs through Rochester Heights and into, the, um, into Walnut Creek. 
Um, whereas they had in other areas of the city where there'd been flooding or drainage issues, they did not charge those residents. Um, so the three uh, images um, up in upper left is flooding during Hurricane Fran. Um, in the, uh, this area is actually on um, Peterson Street, the same street that the Wetland Center is. This is on the north side of Walnut Creek. But basically PJ came to um, uh, address do flood reduction, um, trash dumping, removing trash and debris, and helping to, um, well, this slide, some of the text went off, but basically to try and restore areas that, that had been taken over by invasive species and other things. So PEJ came up with a vision document in 1998 called the Walnut Creek 2000 plan. And uh, there were two primary objectives of uh, this plan. Number one, to have extensive community outreach and engagement um, and education about some of the issues going on here. And secondly, the creation of an urban wetland education park which today is called the Walnut Creek Wetland Center and Wetland Park. Um, the image on the bottom right is the conceptual plan that Dr. Robin Moore um, with NC State's uh, College of Design, who Kofi works with, Dr. Moore is still at the university. Um, this was a conceptual plan back in the late 90s that was, uh, it was completed actually in 2000, 2002, which was the early vision for the Walnut Creek Wetland Park. So with any significant movement for change, they're, uh, they're led by visionary leaders. And these are photos of those visionary leaders. In the top uh, left photo, Dr. Norman Camp, who was a member of St. Ambrose Church and the longtime chairman of PEJ. And to the right of him, um, Edward Milligan, who was the assistant chairperson of PEJ at the time. Uh, the photo on the top right, um, the gentleman in a red shirt, um, the late Ross Andrews, he was a PJ board member who organized and coordinated um, early stream cleanups uh, in the area around the wetland park. Ross invited me to be a, a crew leader for one of these stream cleanups back in 2001. And that's how I became engaged in PEJ's work. Um, and then all of these photos, and at the bottom, Dr. Norman Camp talking to a school group, but you know, he would talk to anybody and anybody who would listen and um, all three of these photos were taken in the fellowship hall of St. Ambrose Church, which kind of served as ground zero for um, PEJ and a lot of the things that uh, happened there. So the image on the left is a 1998 community flyer. The image on the right is a uh, 2000 flyer for a cleanup that was held in the area. So essentially the cleanups would start with a pep talk by either Ross in the red shirt here or Dr. Camp, you know, explaining to everybody what was going on. Um, and then teams would go out, as you see the, the photo in the bottom right, uh, go out and uh, do cleanups, you know, go in the streams, the wetlands, the repairing areas in this area. And th this, this began well before the wetland park was even constructed. Um, and these, the spring, there would be a spring and a fall cleanup and these have now become part of Wake County's big suite, for those of you who are familiar with that, which is led by Wake County Soil and Water Conservation. So, oh man, a lot of the text. Well, I guess the most important uh, uh, text here remained, which is from a period of 1996 to 2007, 57 tons of trash were removed from this area. Um, so in 2008, this was a groundbreaking for the wetland park. Um, I don't know if these, okay, so that's Dr. Norman Camp with the arrow. Um, Dr. Ro Dr. Robin Moore, who is still, who came up with the conceptual design for the wetland park and the former city of Raleigh mayor, Charles Meeker at the site. Um, the dedication ceremony in September, 2009. Um, and so, this is kind of a list, and again, some of these uh, headings have been removed from the, the, but basically this is a list of PEJ's partners from 1995 to 2015. And the question, you know, there's a question that kind of is the theme of this session is, um, how do you grow a collaborative and equitable approach for a watershed? Well, you do that through visionary leaders like uh, Dr. Camp, Ross Andrews, and Milligan, and many other partners. And as well as collaborative partnerships with faith-based organizations, government, nonprofit, private, educational, 
and funding organizations like those listed um, on this table. I'd also like to recognize um, a city of Raleigh uh, water quality, uh, stormwater, and parks and recreation colleagues who have made a concerted effort to help improve historic inequities along Walnut Creek that the city has been blamed for not addressing in the past. So um, that's, uh, that's into my presentation. There's my contact information. Um, thank you for your time and attention. And I'm really looking forward to seeing my colleagues' uh, presentations and hearing from you during the panel and audience discussion if we have time for that. Thank you. Thank you, Amin. Um, Kofi, if I go over, will you like wave your hand around to me? <laughs> time me. Oh, wait, this is you. You're next. Yeah, I'll keep mine right. short. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sophie, you go on up. No, it's perfect timing. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll keep mine brief to a lot more time. I mean, my name is Kofi Boone. I teach landscape architecture at NC State. Uh, happy to be with you today. My presentation is short, but hopefully some of the threads weave through uh, what we're talking about today, because one thing that is apparent is uh, the correlation between race, culture, history, and landscape and the differential exposure risk and hazard risk to different communities based on where they are. So we'll start with this question as a provocation where black and brown communities, often the low lying areas in the American South. And I will say this as a Southerner now, but I'm a native of Michigan. Uh, and uh, so this was a whole phenomenon I was unfamiliar with because Michigan is late planed, it's flat. So everybody's on the same elevation. Uh, this graphic comes from uh, a really interesting study that gave birth to the Capitary Greenway network uh, in Raleigh, uh, the city in the park. So this was done by uh, Bill Flournoy when he was a graduate student at NC State as a justification for the Capitary Greenway. Uh, that project actually came from a, a graduate landscape architecture student, you know, uh, several decades ago, and it was one of the first official greenway systems in the country. But what he was really looking at was the use of greenways as a way to protect uh, streams and rivers uh, from development and from growth. And so he was looking at it through that lens, but he revealed some things that were really interesting in this particular report. So one is the plan of Raleigh. Raleigh has a planned city, uh, the survey done by William Christmas, uh, which in shorthand, he took the plan of Philadelphia and rotated it 90 degrees and put the capital on the high point between Walnut Creek and Crabtree Creek. So even before GIS and geospatial and a lot of the tools and devices that we know today, there was an understanding of what was high ground, what was low ground, uh, what was uh, associated with risk being in areas that flooded, swampy areas and low-lying areas, those were less desirable. Uh, uh, and so the idea of the planned capital city being on the high ground uh, is important. Now, another thing that's important is the timing of when Raleigh was founded. Raleigh was founded during slavery. Uh, and I will say that there's been a renaissance in our particular profession of, we never talked about slavery in landscape architecture until about 10 years ago. Uh, we just ignored that whole episode for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of toxicity. But if you're thinking about uh, a, a, an enterprise that is integrally tied to a very, very distinct understanding of how the land works and operates so you could extract wealth, uh, uh, the period of enslavement is one of those. And it's important to note that this should be a no brainer uh, that uh, black people and African-Americans are not allowed to live within the city limits of Raleigh at its founding. However, there were groups of people whose livelihoods were dependent on their interactions with the city. And so this idea of self-built communities adjacent to the planned city uh, is a period of time uh, that begins this interaction between black and white in Raleigh. And so in this particular phenomenon as Raleigh grows like growth rings in a tree, it starts to absorb these particular areas. Black communities are founded in different places, Oberlin Village, Method Road, uh, Freedman's Land after uh, uh, the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, immediately south of downtown in the area of Rochester Heights, because that is one of the reasons where Rochester Heights emerged. It came from uh, Freedman's land that uh, uh, went back a century before that. Those folks built in the areas that were most available and that were least desirable 
by wealthy interests, namely low-lying areas. And so this is a very specific Raleigh story. And in this map, you can see the locations of South Park East Raleigh, where we spent many years uh, working with folks on one side uh, and in the low-lying area on the south side, the Rochester Heights neighborhood. Uh, it's not a specific phenomenon to Raleigh. So uh, political geographers, Eulen and Wharf in 2006, do this really interesting study correlating race and altitude in Southern, southern cities. Uh, in their study, they looked at 146 Southern cities. And with a few exceptions, uh, they could predict the demographics and the racial profile of places based on how high or low they were on the ground. And invariably inland, where we are, low-lying areas were correlated with black and brown communities. The exceptions were largely on the coast because land values, as you approach the coast with the, you know, the beautiful views of the ocean, uh, those created the highest land values. But essentially where we are in the Piedmont and in other places, that correlation holds. So the specifics of Raleigh are a broader term. Uh, that term that they coined is called racialized topography. Right? And so this is one of the things, at least when we are working in these particular environments, that we think about, right? Uh, who and why do people have more or less exposure risk to floods and hazards? Uh, what are things associated with that? The thing that compounds it is place attachment, right? The idea that even though people were very aware of the risk of flooding uh, and uh, that they were exposed to, that idea of owning land, holding on to land, passing on tradition, connecting to that place makes solution strategies difficult. But that acknowledgement of where that occurred, there were specific things happening in our world that mandated that. This was updated recently by Wayne and Lehman in 2022, this year, a new paper that came out, which projects uh, due to climate change, exposure risk uh, to communities and to flooding. Uh, and they estimate that in these low-lying areas, which are persistent, right? So we talked about this 2006 observation of something that happened soon after the Civil War, uh, that that's sort of resilient, that that pattern sort of uh, persists. But moving forward another generation, right, in 30 years, uh, they're anticipating that those low-lying areas will intensify and those risks will increase by 40%. Uh, estimated about $32 billion of potential damage to these particular communities if we don't work on mitigation, on other strategies to work more in harmony with the water uh, than treat it as an enemy. So the goal of my particular part of the presentation, and we'll revisit it later, is in the framework of environmental justice, it's very important to ground it in the specifics of what happened here, right? And with the richness of information and data with this very powerful case study of partners for environmental justice. But it's not specific to this particular place. It's a pattern, right? And since it's a pattern, we are now in a position where we can look at it, analyze it, critique it, and come up with viable strategies to, to break that pattern. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it. I think I'm under time, I hope. trying to jump the line it's like a very white thing to do anyway <laughs> um, <laughs> <sorry>. so, <laughs> so i'm moving on now um this is yeah, there you go um so i am based at nc state with wri and c grant and um nc state like i said you are in the walnut creek watershed but how has NC State contributed to environmental injustices downstream? Well, just by our very nature of our paving and our piping um, Rocky Branch, which Barbara, I see you're here. Barbara's helped unearth Rocky Branch, which helps. Um, we've been sending our stormwater downstream, which is increasing the flooding that our downstream neighbors are experiencing. So I'm gonna talk now about the Walnut Creek Wetlands Community Partnership, which I help coordinate. And this is um, one thing I always tell people when I talk about this partnership is that we are riffing on everything that PEJ has started and we work in partnership with PEJ. Um, so in 2013, um, Dr. Deidre Crumbly, who um, at the time was NC State faculty in the College of Humanities and Social Science and also a St. Ambrose Church uh, congregant, um, collaborated with Dr. Norman Camp, who was um, the first president of PEJ and one of the founders, um, and also a St. Ambrose congregant. They collaborated to host a forum at NC State 
um, for faculty, staff, and students. And the purpose was to invite um, NC State faculty, staff, and students to listen, to learn about Partners for Environmental Justice, to learn about the Walnut Creek wetlands, um, and to act and to become partners on those efforts. Um, and I actually missed this meeting, but <laughs> I called up Dr. Crumbly and, and I was one of the people who did respond to that call along with Dr. R Louis Rivers, who's in College of Natural Resources, Dr. Kwesi Brookins from the College of Humanities, as well as a number of graduate students um, who are interested. So um, what we did is that we formed this partnership and we met for several months talking about um, our own interests and communities, members' interests. Um, we had City of Raleigh Parks and City of Raleigh um, stormwater at the table, St. Ambrose Church, um, Pastor um, Father Jamon Taylor, um, and nonprofits. Of course, I said PEJ, also um, Center for Human and Earth Restoration. And we came up with a mission, um, and that is to collaborate on education, research, sustainable management of the wetlands, natural resources, and development of the surrounding human community. And, and the elevator pitch is finding solutions that work for nature and people and engaging nature and people in meeting their mutual interests. So how did we start this off? Um, first of all, it's important to listen and understand about the community in which we're working in. Um, we held focus groups and a survey in Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills neighborhoods to hear residents' concerns, particularly around stormwater and flooding and issues of trust with government. Um, and that was a really big one that came up, um, knowing the history of, of how residents have been treated in this community. Um, so this survey and these, the feedback we get created a base for community education and priorities. And you see a few pictures here of some of our additional activities we started working on, um, rain gardens and education and outreach. Um, and that kind of leads me into our second thing. We made small investments for kickoff projects. So the um, surveys and focus groups actually were funded through Dr. Rivers' startup funds as a professor at NC State. So he was able to hire grad students. So he made that own personal investment into the project. We were able to attract um, small grants from American Rivers through a Pisces grant that they had, Pisces Foundation grant, excuse me. Um, to create a um, rain garden at St. Ambrose Church. And it was going to be a small demonstration rain garden, but the, um, the vestry decided, no, we don't want a demonstration. We wanna make a significant impact on the creeks. So um, they applied for cost share funding from city of Raleigh to double the size of their rain garden. And you can see it, see it here and um, during a planting event where um, it was blessed by the church. Um, and we did um, educational outreach with youth and teaching them about watershed science and rain gardens and green stormwater infrastructure. And then they turned around and they taught that to their families. So we did these small projects to try to get that ball rolling on our work um, in addition to what PEJ was already working on. And as we moved forward, larger investments followed. Um, and we were invited by the Conservation Fund to participate in a grant proposal for expanding their Parks with Purpose program. Um, and they were successful in getting that grant. And so we were able to uh, create a community task force um, with the purpose of identifying goals, their community goals and a location for um, additional park facilities that could meet community goals as well as um, nature protection and enhancement. And that's what we did. And you can see Dr. Camp and his wife, Betty, were part of that task force um, before Dr. Camp passed away. Um, and then you can see some of the youth that we worked with with the Neighborhood Ecology Corps in this picture as well. And you'll see our site that was selected, which is the Bailey Drive Gateway. And you'll hear more about that um, from Conservation Fund partner, um, Carmara and Corey Dodd. So, um, we got to the point where we had decide, uh, decided our location with a lot of community involvement and um, hired a, a design, the conservation fund hired a design consulting firm to do the design of that park space 
And they also took over community engagement with that design. So that allowed us to take a breath and turn our focus at NC State towards NWRI, towards um, our community flooding concerns that we had been hearing about from the beginning. Uh, so we got another small grant and created a, a small watershed um, focus plan. And you can see the map on, on the right there is Rochester Heights Creek. So it starts in Biltmore Hills neighborhood. You can see it goes under 40, 440, and then it flows into Walnut Creek through our Bailey Drive park site. So we have a watershed plan for that. Um, we went door to door to the people who lived next to the creek in Rochester Heights Creek just to talk with them and hear about what was important to them. We wanted to do um, neighborhood level projects, but unfortunately, a lot of the homes were rented out and the landlords were not, um, were not really present to work with. But everybody we talked to wanted us to go upstream and work on reducing runoff upstream. So that's what we did. Um, we were able to get a, a EPA 319 grant in partnership with City of Raleigh Stormwater um, to do a comprehensive stormwater retrofit project in a park, a City of Raleigh Park. And so we are in the process of, of working on that. This is our concept plan. So just to kind of circle back to the question that you saw at the beginning, how can we work um, on environmental justice in a community where we've our institution has perpetrated um, injustices in the past. Um, do the work and learn about systemic racism. And I can talk more about that in our discussion period. Um, show up where the community is. Um, certainly when we're invited to show up at St. Ambrose for one of their services, we show up. Um, listen with your own agendas part. Um, a, an EPA environmental justice professional said once, you know, show up, put your agenda in the back seat and just listen when you're in a community. And then be flexible with your own agenda. Um, certainly, we didn't start this thinking that we would be working on a park facility, but that's where we're at because that's what community interest is at and provide funding for nonprofit partners and community members to participate. Uh, their, their insights are valuable and they should be compensated for them. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Cam. Thank you. We're going to switch out here. We're going to do, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I can, let me do the slides first and then I'll go. There. Are you sure? Because yeah. we can go to. No, um, do the slides. Okay. I'll tap. Switch out. Yes. How do you forward the slides? Is it the arrow, this arrow? Yeah. Uh, Rob, I think I broke it. Nope, there, there you go. So how, how come we haven't been clapping during Zoom calls? We just forgot. <laughs> It'll be nice to see everyone in three dimensions. And I've been here all day and I haven't seen anyone's dog. Haven't seen any cats. No one waving their kids off. So it's kind of strange. So um, uh, why am I here? Um, I'm Cam McNutt. I'm with the Modeling and Assessment Branch in DWR, and my job is basically to determine what water bodies in the state are not meeting water quality standards. Walnut Creek is one of those. The other part of my job is what are we going to do about it? And traditionally, it's been a very regulatory approach that doesn't make many considerations for a lot of the things you've heard already, as well as any other thing all across the state. It's come in, we're the state, we're here to help you kind of approach or bring a regulatory hammer. But recently, and Walnut Creek was kind of one of the starters for this, even nationally, is an alternative approach to going to restoration that really puts the responsibility and the desires of the community at the front of it. And I'm just the guy in the background running the tech. That's kind of how we're trying to do this. So with that forward, there we go. So what's a watershed action plan? Who's, who's heard of a, a nine element restoration plan? I know a lot of you have, yeah, there we go. Uh, this is basically a nine element restoration plan. One of the problems that I had with the nine element restoration plans is because it, when it got attached to getting funding, it also became, it, EPA calls it the minimum nine elements. If you go look at the original guidance, there's like 45 elements. 
what I thought was happening is we were getting too skinny on the elements. We weren't really doing that much. We were just trying to do just enough to be able to get grant funding to do a project. So I wanted something that was going to live into the future for a very long time as these restoration projects processes are going to take a very long time. So we basically moved that nine element plan process. I would call it, we're more like about 12 elements now. Um, and we can add more as we go. That's the whole idea of being flexible, but it's uh, running in an interactive uh, map base and it's a process and we're using it for developing uh, restoration plans and tracking implementation, which is something we have failed to do very well in the past. It is a flexible and dynamic process as we get more technology, new tools. If people want to go a different direction, we can change it. It's not a big bound three ring binder in Cam's office that someone has to go find the original Word document for to go change it. You just go add your stuff and change it and said, oh, we replaced that. It's accessible to all partners. And that means we're making it accessible to uh, environmental engineers all the way down to your neighbors. So we want everyone to be able to see this. And as I, my, my, my dream here is that one day I'm gonna walk into, walk into, not zoom into a Wake County commissioner's meeting and see someone doing a presentation with one of these plans and I have nothing to do with it. That's, that's kind of like where I wanna get to at some point. Uh, important on the cost side is it's self-building and updating. So the background maps that I'll show you in a minute are running behind every single plan that we're putting together in the state. There's, these aren't customized. So we can customize each plan by just getting in and doing some things that the local people wanna have done. But for instance, we update the impaired waters list every two years. No one has to go update that, it's automatic. It just loads right up. Any new data stream we get, we can load it up and we're probably running 75 data sets in the background right now, but you can go turn them on when you go into these applications so you can get all the permitted facilities if you need it. Whatever you need to get, we can put it in here and make it run. Um, Community-based project development. We actually have a couple of tools where with very minimal training, people that live out in the community can develop their own watershed improvement projects. It's anywhere from, and these are projects large and small. It's not just big capital improvement projects. It's rainbow. One of the projects is turning your gutters into the grass. That helps. That's the thing, kind of things that we want to track. It's also non-regulatory. All we're looking for, and we have agreement with EPA on this, is that there is a level of effort happening that we believe that a restoration of some uses, some water quality standards will happen in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time so that we do not have to take a regulatory approach to restoring water quality. Uh, a couple of the applications, now we have built some of these in-house and others were, were stealing, but we have two different approaches. We have one that I'm calling pro, which is, it requires some training to use it. And then we have some that are community science-based. So people can look at a quick PowerPoint presentation or a video and figure out how to use these tools to collect information that then instantly populates itself into the plan. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with that. I've been doing this now as kind of a pilot for about five years. So far, nothing's gone wrong. So we're gonna keep going with it open. We were basically debating on whether to make these password protected and trained or just leave them wide open. Right now, they're wide open. So we're still getting a lot of uh, people trained in using these applications. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, as I said in the flexibility point, we can bring in new tools at any time if someone finds a way to do something better or a new approach to doing things. Um, one of the main tools that we're developing right now, it's not really a tool, it's kind of like a TurboTax for a watershed plan. It kind of walks people through the process of developing their goals. So we kind of say, oh, well, you need to have a Clean Water Act goal, that's great, but then all the other goals, up to you, economic, we need a park, we need more recreation space, that can all be incorporated into this planning process. So we have a lot more flexibility to work with communities to put together plans that they want to see happen. And within the Walnut Creek watershed, we're gonna have a lot of diverse approaches to doing this as well. Here's uh, one of the tools, this is what it looks like on a phone. You can uh, download the app for free. You can get the surveys, there's, there's training materials available. And this one's called Community Whips. And this is the one where you're going neighbor to neighbor, 
Hey, let's get you some rain barrels. Hey, let's turn back your gutters. Hey, let's get a little rain garden in here. Hey, let's pick up all the oil drums that are sitting in your backyard. You know, that sort of little bitty projects that we want to account for, because if you do a lot of little ones, you end up with a pretty good big one. Okay, there's what it looks like, but I'm going to try to switch to the live one. Is it alt tab? Yep. Oh, did I miss it? Did it show up? Yeah. There you go. I'm not very good with the mouse pads, so this is going to be awkward. <laughs> um, but basically, on, this, on the tabs over here, we have a bunch of information and links to information. And then we built a, uh, a geodatabase that is like a bookcase that houses Lots of little documents that we've been incorporating into this. We've got uh, the goals and strategies document in here. We've got water quality fact sheets in here. We've got uh, peak flow targets in here for stormwater purposes. Anything that people need to have that applies to the whole watershed, we can store in this database. And then we also put links to those documents in these tabs. And I'm just going to take you to the one tab, but community involvement. And this is one that is being run by our environmental education folks. And then community involvement for subplans. We have a lot of places where people are making smaller plan areas and they're still falling under the goals of the larger plan area, but they might be more specific like something like a park or some other type of thing that is a watershed improvement project. It's in a watershed, it's an improvement project. We didn't say it had to improve the water, but it does improve the watershed in whatever way you can think of it. And I think I'm about at time right there. But uh, this is open to the public. We don't pass the site around, but we are getting ready to start posting these plans, uh, the, the links on our website at, uh, at DWR. And right now we have all those dots. I think there's 12 of them. Those are the 12 plans that we have going on right now. So you can actually go into one plan and see all the others if you want to, you may not see some of the details. And I will stop there and I'll be around if people have questions on the tech on that. But the, the thing to remember is it's, it's a tool to get the community at all levels engaged and not have to go to Cam's office and find a three ring binder that has a bunch of really indecipherable maps on it that are now 25 years old. Thank you, Cam. And then the other piece of the scaling up is there is a watershed level action team that a memes group with DWR has formed to work with this. Um, what did we say? Alt tab here? Sorry, multitasking here. Can you believe that? <laughs> um, anyway, the, the watershed level team meets, I think, quarterly, maybe by, by annually. Kind of semi-annually semi -annually, and we share and collaborate watershed wide using this plan as a yep i think that's it Let's see okay and now we're switching to a zoom um, presentation and i believe um amy will be sharing her um her slides, Rob, is there something I have to do to get her on? And just, got it. Like I haven't been using Zoom for two years. <laughs> okay. And Amy, you can share your screen. Thank you. Are you guys seeing it? Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me today. Thanks, Christy, um, for the little introduction. Um, so my name's Amy Farinelli. I'm with the City of Raleigh Stormwater Management Division. Um, I've been with the city for about five years. Um, I'm currently a project manager. Um, obviously, five years is kind of a short time in the span of this entire partnership. Um, 
So with that said, I, you know, did want to acknowledge that there's a lot of folks that I've worked with past and present who have been involved in this partnership as well. Um, so it's not all, you know, my work and um, efforts. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. If I can get the slide to proceed. Um, and I don't want to rehash all the great uh, presentation that my co-presenters have done um, in terms of the history, but did want to just give kind of a high level overview of how the city has responded to calls to action in the community around the wetland over the past couple of decades. Um, so in 2003, a park bond was approved that included funds to create the park and the education center, which was completed in 2009. Um, in 2014, a walkable watershed plan was developed. In 2018, a master plan was adopted for the park. And in that same year, um, the park facility was renamed the Norman and Betty Camp Education Center in honor of the couple's contributions, both to PEJ and the park. Um, and throughout this time, city staff from various departments, as I've mentioned, have tried to make a concerted effort to be present and involved um, and supportive of the partnership, attending meetings, things like that, um, to the best of our abilities. Um, so now that we had these plans in hand for the watershed and um, the park, it was time to show the community that we valued their input and their involvement in the development of those plans and we were gonna take action. So the most notable on the ground projects that have come from the walkable watershed plan are our GSI retrofit projects that were installed this past fall. Um, so there's a newly installed subsurface gravel wetland across from the education center on Peterson Street, as well as a linear bioretention cell that's on the same side of the street, just a little bit past the greenway. Um, we've also contributed funds to community and partner like GSI in the area, as Christy mentioned. Another element of the walkable watershed plan was an emphasis on education as a way to foster stewardship in the community. And one of the ways that we've done that is through art. Um, so in 2020, we worked with three local artists to use trash that was collected from the stream to create uh, temporary sculptures of wildlife that can be found there to kind of send the message and spread awareness to folks that trash, you know, it is a big problem in Walnut Creek and that it um, can affect not just water quality, but the critters that live there. And currently we're really excited to be working with Derek Beasley, who's pictured to the right um, on the slide. He is working on a GSI educational display for us to um, kind of explain to the public um, to help them better understand the GSI that's been implemented within the context of the community. So he's going to be, um, you know, educating on that, but also exploring themes of permeation, environmental justice, and healing, um, because he does want to incorporate the community in the piece. Um, stormwater staff have also provided educational workshops every fall and spring at the center. Um, so one of them that we do is on rain barrels and rain gardens, and we also do workshops on stream monitoring for those that are interested. Um, and stormwater, as well as other departments, staff have also been um, heavily involved in the watershed learning network that PEJ has started, um, not only providing presentations, but I know our sustainability staff have been helping um, to try and secure funds to continue and expand the program. As for the park master plan, um, we're really excited that this fall, um, our parks department is gonna be completing trails that will connect Rochester Heights to the education center, um, as well as trails connecting the education center to a teaching platform at the wetlands edge to kind of built upon that mission of education. Um, and there's lots of other ideas and projects that have come about from the master plan. Many of them 
um, through the Parks with Purpose program. So I'll um, you know, leave that for Carmera to discuss. Um, but I did just wanna mention, of course we have other projects in the watershed um, downstream from the wetland area is Worthdale Park. And that's the site of this incised stream that you see on the slide. So we're in the process of beginning the design phase for a stream restoration there, as well as GSI retrofit project. Um, and throughout the entire watershed um, and really the whole city, but Walnut Creek is a really important area for this. We also have a flood early warning program. Um, so we have technologies such as stream gauges and rain gauges throughout vulnerable areas in Raleigh that help us to collect data to better anticipate storms and notify the public in order to improve safety. Um, in terms of our project planning and budgeting process, we're also trying to incorporate equity. So our, our current prioritization model for stormwater projects includes a lot of the typical stormwater factors. So water quality, public health and safety, flooding, things like that. But it also, um, projects do get points for having community support, um, having non-stormwater community benefits, as well as the possibility of leveraging other funding, such as grants, in order to complete the project. Um, and those factors have allowed us to elevate some projects uh, based on both social and environmental factors. In addition to that, as a citywide initiative, there is also an environmental justice mapping tool that's being developed. Um, it's still in the planning phases, but we hope to use that to better identify and um, implement and prioritize projects from an EJ perspective. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, we have made efforts um, in recent years to diversify our um, Storm Water Management Advisory Commission, which is a citizen advisory board that reports to council and really um, kind of sets a direction of what the division does. Um, and we've diversified it in many ways, but those of you who are familiar with the Walnut Creek wetland area will recognize some of the folks in this picture. Claudia Graham is in the front and she um, recently came off of our board, but she's a member of the Walnut Creek community, as well as Reverend Taylor, um, who as Christy mentioned, is the director at St. Ambrose Church. Um, so they've, you know, played them and other past and present commissioners have played a really huge role in questioning the way we do things and setting the stage for us to do things better and to, you know, take into consideration the community in our decisions as well. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, and that's all I have for my presentation and I'll um, let Carmera take over. My screen, give me one second. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Great. My name is Kamara Thomas. I'm with the Conservation Fund. I'm the Director of Urban Conservation Initiatives. I will be presenting with Corey Dodd from Design Workshop. The Conservation Fund is a U.S.-focused nonprofit that creates solutions benefiting the environment, communities, and climate. We work in all 50 states, our headquarters is in the DC area, and we have worked for over 30 years to protect more than 8.5 million acres of land. We focus on conservation and people, building stronger partnerships to ensure the value of history and culture are integrated into environmental conservation. Since 2017, the Conservation Fund has worked in marginalized communities of color, especially black and brown communities, really calling out community-centered approaches to support park restoration, revitalization, and to mitigate impacts of climate change, working with local partners and residents to increase access to green spaces, skills training, environmental education, and land management. Through the Parks with Purpose program, we have delivered new parks and green spaces through multiple benefits. <clears throat> 
By addressing environmental injustice, we are working to address multiple issues, especially in communities that are impacted by stormwater flooding, lack publicly accessible green spaces, connect communities to healthy food and outdoor recreation, and work with communities and local partners to strengthen their capacity and empower greener foundations. We focus in five cities, in Atlanta, Baltimore, DC, Raleigh, and Durham, and we approach decades of economic disinvestment and environmental injustices to revitalize or create new community assets such as green space, parks, and community spaces. Most importantly, these projects are planned, developed, and implemented driven by community residents and local stakeholders. We're investing in the people in conjunction with environment, economic, and social justice out outcomes. Chrissy mentioned our partnership and how we started working in Raleigh. The partners prioritize an area prone to flooding in historically Black neighborhoods in Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills. And they also lacked connections to the wetland park Design students were charged with developing a site program and conceptual plan through a participatory um, workshop with partners and priorities were set for a future project, which you'll hear about soon. Some of the project highlights and priorities include multiple ben benefits of addressing stormwater mitigation, but also increasing local community engagement. You'll see the partners list here. They include the Conservation Fund, WRI, Partners for Environmental Justice, or PEJ, the Walnut Creek Wetland Community Partnership, City of Raleigh Parks and Recreation, Raleigh Arts, St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, Fuller Elementary, and the residents of Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills. The Conservation Fund also has support from a key funder, the JPB Foundation, who has provided an initial level of investment and focuses on building green foundations in urban cities. Something that Amin mentioned earlier about ecological restoration, many of our Parks with Purpose pro, um, projects include workforce or skills training opportunities. And with a grant from the Duke Energy Foundation, we were able to work with Step Up Ministries, PEJ, WRI, and American Conservation Experience, or ACE, to engage America, AmeriCorps volunteers and local residents to clean up and restore the area around Rochester Heights, removing invasive species and replanting native trees and plants. And this project will happen again summer and fall. The task force that I mentioned earlier, um, they prioritize these different benefits for a project, which included green infrastructure and local park engagement, access, restoration and cleanup, intergenerational engagement, and celebrating the local history and culture of the area. And this project priorities were identified through that uh, community visioning process. And it will, um, Corey will share now a little bit of a spotlight of the project that um, was selected. Corey, I'm gonna, uh, I can advance the slides if you wanna. Sure, that would be great. Thank you so much, Carmere. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you again, Carmere, and hello, everyone. And thank you again to Christy and to those in the panel. It's a privilege to present with you today. As a member of the design consultant team that is working in partnership with the Conservation Fund on the Bailey Drive Gateway at Wanna Creek Wetland Park, I'm excited to share this spotlight with you. The 10 acre Bailey Drive Gateway site borders the Walnut Creek Wetland Park and is separated from the rest of the park by Walnut Creek itself. The site is located at the northern boundary of the historic Rochester Heights in Southeast Raleigh. And the entire site lies within the 100 year floodplain with half of the site within the floodway. The Walnut Creek Trail passes near the site but is not connected to the neighborhood. This project will create new park amenities and the Southern Park entrance that serve the communities of Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills the two historically black mid-century modern neighborhoods that are south of the park. Bailey Drive Gateway will be a place for gathering, play, storytelling, learning about the history and green infrastructure of the park and connecting to the rest of the park and the city of Raleigh Greenway system. Next slide, please. 
This Parks with Purpose project kicked off in the fall of 2019, and by working with the community, an engagement process was designed that sought to energize a neighborhood that has suffered from environmental and social marginalization. A variety of innovative techniques were deployed, which utilized oral histories, art, poetry, and ecological and environmental justice education. Community input has led each phase of the project from conceptual design to launching the project website to the design and installation of temporary art. Opportunities for residents to bring their desires to the forefront of decisions have been woven throughout this process, contributing to a strong collaborative relationship between residents and project partners. Next slide, please. Beyond the project site history of being located in a floodplain, site analysis and partnership with Kofi Boone's Landscape Architecture Graduate Studio at NCSU and discussions with neighbors revealed the neighborhood's cultural significance of Black land ownership and Black home ownership in Raleigh, Rochester Heights being the first Black subdivision in Raleigh. The land was formerly the Leitner family dairy farm owned by the Leitner family, excuse me, owned by the family of Raleigh's first Black mayor, Clarence Leitner. Many of the streets in the neighborhood are named after many great Black talents of the era, including Pearl Bailey, Cav Calloway, and Ella Fitzgerald, to name a few. Next slide, please. The early conceptual design process launched in the fall of 2019 in preparation for public workshops and a series of pop-up engagement events held at the Wetland Center and at St. Ambrose Church. The design team developed materials that shone a spotlight on neighborhood history, the character and function of Walnut Creek Wetland, and the opportunities for Bailey Drive Gateway to feature both cultural and environmental stories. The toolkit for these conversations included visual preference boards that allowed community members to vote on the types of features and aesthetics they would like to see at the future park. The chip game was another engagement exercise where participants were given scaled program pieces and a blank site map and invited to fill out the map according to their own vision for the future Bailey Drive Gateway site. An amenity budget game where residents ranked their preferences by applying monopoly money to different amenities told us which program elements, infrastructure needs, and aesthetic features neighbors wanted to see implemented in this project. Desires for cultural representation and to highlight the historical significance of the community led to the selection of concept number two, a walk in the neighborhood, being the concept that was originally drawn from oral histories. Next slide, please. This project has worked to rekindle civic pride using the community's rich history as a basis for design. We have been fortunate to partner with Partners for Environmental Justice, a nonprofit organization founded in the 1990s, as Amin and others have mentioned, by a collective of residents who organized to address health and quality issues of quality of life issues for Southeast Raleigh. Partners for Environmental Justice laid the foundation for what would become the Share Your Stories initiative in the spring of 2020. The initiative allowed us to maintain project momentum during the onset of the pandemic and provided another outlet to honor the community's preference for site elements that would celebrate their history. Partners for Environmental Justice allowed their collection of recordings and transcripts to be posted on the project website, as you can see here, along with those collected by the design team and provided insight into which residents and descendants of original homeowners were best to begin conversations with. Next slide, please. An additional effort to maintain project momentum and provide the community with a tangible representation of their story was the creation of a temporary art installation. Through a call for artists, Brooklyn-based artist Tiffany Baker was selected to design and build the installation on the site because of her unique interpretation of local culture and history and her emphasis on honoring the stories of original homeowners through glass portraiture. Tiffany was extremely engaged by the storytelling aspect of the project and developed the concept for the art installation based on her vision of how residents would react to walking through the site while having their skin bathed in different colored light from the sun shining through glass porches of notable community figures. Although Tiffany's portfolio primarily features painted and hand-drawn portraiture, she consciously selected glass for this project as its inherent material qualities serve as a representation of the resilience of communities belonging to the African and Black diaspora. And so her concept, the reflective history was formed. Slide, please. Through a multi-step and labor-intensive process, Tiffany brought to life original family photographs of original homeowners, Willie Taylor Hicks, a retired school teacher who at nearly 100 years old still enjoys her, her home in the neighborhood. 
Lillian Curran, also a former teacher at the neighborhood's own Fuller Elementary School and par parishioner at St. Ambrose Church and Millard Roosevelt Peebles, who was the first to move into the neighborhood and the prominent black masonry contractor who led the construction of the home in Rochester Heights. Their portraits were revealed during the summer of 2021 during a block party style event attended by more than 100 residents, their families, friends, and project partners. Next slide, please. Following the temporary art installation, the design team developed schematic design, a process that has allowed for a deeper dive into the physical opportunities and constraints that will determine what site elements the future site, the future park, excuse me, can support and where. The schematic design proposes three gateway areas. The Western Gateway, which is the primary site entry and destination with an open air pavilion, gardens, seat walls, picnic tables, interpretive art and signage, and a flexible open lawn space. The central gateway is a secondary site entry with more intimate gathering space and an accessible connection to the city of Raleigh Trail that will connect visitors to State Street and Walnut Creek Wetland Park. And lastly, the eastern gateway is the smallest and offers the easternmost Bailey Drive sidewalk connection and a connection to the city of Raleigh Trail and to State Street. Next slide, please. In this rendering of the Western Gateway entry point, an example of potential interactions between visitors with permanent glass, installations, site views to the restored wetland and access to the pavilion by way of a flexible lawn space I displayed. Next. And in this rendering, we're depicting the view of the pavilion from Bailey Drive. The pavilion drive is, draws its inspiration from the mid-century modernism of neighborhood homes and the artwork of Tiffany Baker provides super graphics, which elevate the significance of the stories and memories of neighborhood residents. This project represents a preservation and honoring of culture and history of this neighborhood is Raleigh's first black subdivision and the ways in which residents who were notable educators Healthcare professionals, attorneys, government officials, skilled craftspeople, and philanthropists contributed to the social and cultural fabric of our city. Thank you to the countless residents who have opened their homes to us, and thank you to each of our project partners and to all of you today. A little longer than we thought, but we still have a little bit of time left. Um, do I need to do anything, Rob? Are we good? This is we're good. We just need to talk into microphones. And Kofi, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'm going to monitor the chat here. That sounds good. There was a lot uh, presented. Um, we do have questions, but uh, I'd like to defer to the audience first before we get into our discussion. Is there anything that? Uh, any questions or anything you'd like to share before we get going? Thank you for sharing. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm at Lenore Ryan University. And I think Amin alluded to this, but I'm not sure. Um, and I'm just wondering about gentrification pressure and green gentrification. And I'm wondering the extent to which you're working with housing authorities or other um, agencies or across the boundaries to address those potential pressures if they really exist in these communities. And so I, I need to be educated about that, but, but I'm wondering if that's happening and, and if so, what you're doing about it. Um, Thank you. Can you yeah, I'm not sure if this is on. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, it is a huge issue. New York Times did an article about um, gentrification going on in a community called South, I think it's South Park, which is right yeah. adjacent to Rochester Heights. So um, it is going on. Um, there are other agencies and nonprofits in the area that are di uh, directly dealing with that. You know, that, that's not in our wheelhouse per se, but it's related to, it, it, it all falls under equitable development and environmental justice to, um, you know, to re, um, re uh, think, forget the word, but to correct past environmental injustices that have happened. So yes, it's a huge issue. City of Raleigh has done, has had um, meetings about it. And uh, there are folks working to address those pressures, even in and around Rochester Heights. 
Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Um, hi, my, my name is Kavita, Kavita Ampika Devi with Division of Water Infrastructure of DEQ. Um, I have a comment and a question. So I'll make the comment first. Uh, with the ARPA funds, like you must have heard about all the you know, American Recovery Fund coming, we have about 100 million of stormwater fund grant funding that's coming through our division. And we are working on our priority system you know, update for next fall, um, accepting an application. So I want like you know everyone to be aware and we'll have a a presentation this evening around five o'clock or so, you know, explaining more about that funds. But um, that's not my question. We will be using our uh, environmental justice map that was developed, you know, our, you know, in, in our DEQ website. So we plan to give a, a priority for the projects if it's benefits to the minority population. So if it serves more than 75%, you know, more than 75% of the people are, you know, minority population that's benefiting from a particular project, it gets into like way high priority, like, you know, all grants and stuff like that. So uh, my question is like when uh, the DEQ has developed and posted that EJ map, um, how PEJ, P, PEJ has any stake on that? Did you even uh, make sure like, did you at some point, did you make sure that all the minority population parcels are included? Because I keep hearing it that map is not accurate. So we have to go with some sort of a map to make sure the minority population is you know, covered and then we are not overlooking any small holes that, you know, we're not. So my, my question is like, are you aware of like updating those kind of thing or do you have any stake on it? And I know there's efforts to uh, update those maps and make them more granular. Um, part of the problem is that I think a lot of it was based on the census block data, which might be too, the scale might not be good enough to identify specific areas for projects. And also, as they were just talking about the gentrification, those areas can change. Wow, I've doubled up here. <laughs> Those, those areas can turn over very quickly. We're seeing that right now. So what might look like an EJ community this week may not be next week. And then there might be a new AG community, EJ community somewhere else. It's just not getting overlooked. So I think a lot of what we're gonna have to do is talk with the local governments because they know what's, what's going on that may not be reflected in a map. What, one thing that I have done, and it seems to overlie pretty good with what my experience is, is if you take the statewide parcel data set, which is updated pretty regularly, and if you compare the owner address with the site address and they're different, then you've got a rental community. And if you see high densities of rental communities, then that, that seem, the where areas where I've tested it, that seems to line up pretty, pretty easily with what the environmental justice maps looked at. So I kind of like do a little truth statement on that, but that is changing too. So it's not tried and true, but that's one way to do it. And I think I mean, yeah. Another good tool is the e, um, EPA has an EJ screen tool. Um, and then for the grant program that I manage with Division of Water Resources, um, I do site visits. So we give points for underserved communities. They get extra points in terms of our grant review. Um, so even if a site or a project area is located in a tier three or wealthier community, there still are EJ and underserved communities within those. And by doing the site visit, I can, you know, it can just tell based on where, where I'm at, um, you know, whether it, it, it is or it is not. They are not in the map, they can already use some other tool to show us 
Hi, my name's Lisa Sorg. I'm from NC Policy Watch. And my question kind of dovetails into an earlier presentation about buyouts in Goldsboro in the floodplain. If FEMA were to come in and for whatever reason say, I'm gonna, we can offer you X number of dollars to buy out your home. This kind of leads to the gentrification question. Where do these folks go? They're not going to get the amount of money for their home if they're in a floodplain and in a buyout to be able to live in Raleigh. We just saw the median home price is $420,000. That's the median. So are these buyout programs, who do they really, I mean, I see that they benefit by you're, you're not gonna flood anymore, but there seems to be an elliptical solution that doesn't know, that, where do these folks go? Yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, there's no tracking of where they go. So that's one thing that's important as we start to build the research on that is to start to figure that out. So a lot of communities down east, that, that's a major issue. So we've been working in Princeville and other places where that's a high priority. Uh, so that, that there's, a, there's a piece of information that we just don't know. The comparatives in terms of comps is important. So the fact that, you know, what do you really get for your home? Uh, if you're trying to stay in the same area where you need to maintain your social ties, you need to maintain a lot of systems that you're relying upon, uh, you know, the difficulty to do that, to even find a, a comparable for that. I believe in this case, the buyouts uh, were very specific. I th believe that even the Bailey Drive Gateway project includes some buyouts. I don't think there are any other buyouts being anticipated. So in urban areas that are constrained, it's a, it's a little bit of a different challenge. But you raise a really good point with regards to um, all of the secondary, tertiary, but with some people, central benefits and impacts of losing your home place. And we just don't have a good strategy for it yet. I will say that there was a comment about granularity with data. Um, uh, it's preached to the choir in here that a lot of these FEMA floodplain maps aren't accurate. Right. Uh, and that we're getting better with LIDAR and other tools to get more sophisticated and more focused and concentrated on the actual impacts, anticipate actual impacts of flooding, which in some places has resulted in opportunities for adaptation and not having to relocate. But using a very coarse grain of data, you know, it, it's sort of like a one size fits all regarding policy where it's easy enough to just put a line on a particular community and say it's all in the floodplain, all has equal risk you know, all should be relocated through a bio program, when in fact it's more finely grained than that. And my hope is that the technology gets more accessible to communities to be able to start to get that finer grain, both demographically, but also ecologically, so that in certain cases, adaptation is, is a real possibility without having to completely relocate. My name's Joey Hester, I'm with DWR. Um, my question is entirely selfish. Um, so the one of the biggest efforts that the state's put into um, this area, this watershed um, to, to regulate water quality was the Falls Lake rules um, that I think a lot of us here are familiar with. Uh, and I think we all understand that they're aimed at alleviating nutrient issues, eutrophication issues. Um, but my question would be, I think, you know, given that so much effort and time and energy was put into that, um, with respect to, to some of these localized community issues, did that, did any of that help, hurt, or do absolutely nothing? Um, was any of that complementary to, to the energy here. I mean, I know that there have been grant funding programs that have that have fed resources in. Um, I say that because I am in charge of developing a complementary uh, or a, a similar kind of nutrient strategy, and I'm hoping to sort of start thinking about ways that that can, that strategy can do better for some of these localized community issues and respond to. EJ concerns in a way that we haven't done before. It's a new game for us. I'll come up here just because I know this mic is on. I, I don't know how Falls Lake would impact Walnut Creek where a, the, oh, the noose rules. Yeah, the noose. Um, it has given us some additional priority, I guess, for grants. Cam, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, I think one of the 
one of the motivations to, um, I would say, go small in Walnut Creek is because when we started implementation of the new estuary, we acted like all the work was for the new estuary and we blew off all the streams that were impaired. So when, when someone says we spent whatever it is now, 13 billion in the new and the estuary is not any different. Um, but there's a whole bunch of streams that have gotten better because people were doing work in them and we lost track of that. And that's the reason we're going into this watershed action plan driven part is to take the, if you look in the watershed action plan for Walnut Creek, it never says NSW anywhere in it. It's about Walnut Creek and anything you do in Walnut Creek is gonna improve nutrients downstream. But to the other question of environmental justice, I, I think that may have been considered by some local governments, but I think for the most part, it was about, you know, checking a box and getting that 30% reduction. I think, I think there were not a lot of other considerations given. That's another reason we wanna go into this more flexible restoration approach is to open that up a lot more. Um, I think we're just starting to go over time. So we're going to go ahead and end here. Thank you so much for joining us. And, um, you know, you can catch us on the way out if you have any additional questions. And thank you to our panelists and our online um, community as well.